Welcome to Cassis. Thank you for choosing to spend your morning with us. Today, we are launching our updated mission statement. We're very excited to share it with you. Our mission has always been rooted in our value, loving people into the freedom and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Our mission is reflective of the beliefs that Cassis has always deeply held. So beginning today, we get to live them out in a very tangible way. And we hope this is a blessing to you and to those around you. Now, in addition to this mission statement reveal, we have so much going on right now. It's all very exciting. So here we go. You should have received a small card on your way in this morning. This calendar card contains dates of all the upcoming important events, and you won't want to miss any of them. So stick it on your fridge to keep track of all of the fun things that are happening around here. In fact, pass it along to a friend or a neighbor as an invitation to go ahead and join us for those moments. There are two events on that card that are actually happening really soon. Discover Cassis is a three-week class that explores some of Cassis's deeply held beliefs and values. This class is very helpful for anyone who is new to Cassis, but also if you've been attending here for a while, this class could be for you too. If you've always wondered about certain things, this is a great class to attend and ask questions to discover about Cassis and who we are at our core. Discover Cassis begins August 28th. You can register by visiting our website at CassisChurch.org or in our Linktree bio on our social media page. Part of who we are as a loving church is reaching out to our wider community. In order to live this out, right now we're collecting school supplies. These supplies are used by a local school district, and they're given to kids that need them to make their school year a success. We're going to have a specific list soon, and you'll be able to bring in the supplies to this church beginning August 28th. And we also have new shirts available today that have our mission words, accepted, loved, and free. As always, they're just $5, and it's an easy way to be reminded of who we are here at Cassis and to remind others while you're out in the community. They can also be great conversation starters and an easy way to invite somebody to church. If you're visiting us for the first time today, we're very glad that you're here. We ask that you text the word guest to the number that's below because we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to stop by our Welcome Center. We have a small gift for you and we would like to meet you. You'll also receive a welcome card and we ask that you fill that out and either return it to that Welcome Center or drop it in one of the giving boxes in the back of the room. Whether you're joining us in person or online, thanks for being with us. Well, good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here together. I just want to invite you to stand. Let's sing together. Let's worship together. And you don't just tolerate us. You don't have somewhere to go. We're not your trophy children. You abandon when we roam. Your mercy's not a favor. And your presence isn't rushed, oh no, our God is love. The cross was not a vehicle for you to finally care. When we look upon your character, your grace was always there. Acceptance not with help from us, no need to measure up, oh God is love. His arms are open for all to gather here. The cross has spoken. There's nothing left to fear. Once and for all He shown.
Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Why don't you take a couple minutes and say hi to people, and here's the question of the day. Is it too soon for pumpkin spice season? I'm with you. Yeah, I find myself after carving pumpkins for 20 years, like, is it ever pumpkin spice season? Because <laughs> those are just gross on the inside. Yeah, anyway. But well, we're going to move into a time of offering, and there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can give online at casaschurch.org, um, or there's offering boxes in the back as well that you can drop an offering in. And if you're new with us today, gosh, we are so happy that you're with us. You picked a really, really fun Sunday to be with us. And um, if you got a welcome bag out at the front, there's a welcome card in there. And we'd love for you to fill that out and drop those out in the boxes as well. And I want you to join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for uh, just your love and grace. And uh, thank you for your blessings on our lives uh, so that we can give back to you and multiply those blessings and um, just do amazing things, Father. Um, and uh, we love you. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Don't you stand? Yeah, sing this with us. Who am I that the highest king will welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. It's his love for me.
you, Lord. We praise your name because you first loved us. Help us to go and love others. Lord, thank you so much for the grace that we receive. Let's sing this together.
God, your love is so beautiful. We'll never know a love like yours, except for yours. And we do stand in awe of you, God. Thank you so much for that amazing love. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can take a seat. And as we've said already a couple of times today, this is a really big Sunday for us. Uh, We are launching our updated mission statement, which is loving people into the acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ. Now, this has been in the works for well over a year. Uh, The pastors and staff started crafting this, working on it, brought in Casas Council uh, to speak into it, the elders as well, just really like articulating the kind of language that's fresh and relevant um, that we really wanted to have as we launched into this next chapter of what God is calling us to. And, um, you know, mission statements are kind of a big deal because it helps us organizationally but it also helps us strategically. So how we think about what we do in ministries, what we do for events, what we do for projects, all of that hangs on this mission statement of how do we love people into the acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ. And you know, it's, it's different when, than when we talk about like our values and our theology, because even though our, you know, our values are who we are and our theology is how we think about God, but that mission statement is fully aligned with both of those things. And you know, every church has a unique calling from God to where they are, who they are, what they're trying to do. And this is ours. And we're so excited for it, of how we can continue to love people into that acceptance and freedom of Christ. And, um, you know, so it kind of begs the question of like, okay, so what do we do with this? Like, what do we do now, you know? And I want to tell you, wherever you are, you have a part in this, you are part of this mission. Whether or not you've been here for decades, or if this is your first Sunday, welcome. This is a great Sunday for you to have a first time here. Um, If you've got little ones over in Costas Kids or students in middle school or high school, or if you're part of an adult community, or if you volunteer in tech or guest services or music or anywhere else on campus, you have a role in this. You have a part to play in this. This is our heading. This is our direction. This is our goal. This is what we're going to all work together towards to accomplish is how can we get better at loving people into that acceptance and freedom offered by Jesus Christ. And so going forward, I want to ask you to do a few things. First, we're going to take the next, we're going to take today and the next two Sundays to really unpack this statement. What does it mean when we talk about acceptance? What does it mean when we talk about loving people? What does it mean when we talk about living in freedom of Christ? And you might tell from what you've seen around and lots of shirts on platform this morning that um, these three words are the key pieces of that mission statement. Accepted, loved, free. So we're gonna take each Sunday starting today of breaking out what those words mean, what we really mean by them when we say, what does it mean to be accepted? What does it mean to be loved? What does it mean to be free? So I want you to be here. I want you to be a part of this. This is such an exciting chapter in where we are as a church. And you know, if you think about it, since you're already here today, you're a third of the way done, right? There's only two more after this one. So you're almost there. So come be here for the next two Sundays. And if you can't, I know life happens, be sure and just watch it online and, and listen to how we talk about these words. And secondly, if you have questions about any of these words or this statement, ask them. Find somebody to ask a question to. Ask a, a key volunteer leader that maybe you know or work with or volunteer with or ask somebody on staff. And we'd love to like process that with you. Third thing, if you know a story or if you have a story for what it means to be accepted or loved or free, share that. We wanna hear that story because those are beautiful stories. So share them with friends, family, share them with one of us on staff. We'd love to hear that. And finally, just as we've been doing for years and years, continue to look for ways that you can tangibly and uniquely love someone into that acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ. 
This is a beautiful adventure that God has in front of us. And I'm so excited to be stepping into this with all of you. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna see God work in ways that we can't even imagine today. And so I just invite you to step into that with all your energy and might, and let's do this thing together. It's gonna be amazing. To give someone acceptance is to let them know that they have a place with you. The good news is you don't have to agree with someone to make a place for them. You just have to love them right where they are. We may find ourselves pretending to be something we aren't in order to belong, but acceptance means that you don't have to pretend. After all, God is seeking to connect with the real you. And as a church, so are we. Well, good morning. It's good to have you all, <clears throat> excuse me, good to have you all uh, here. And as uh, Miles was saying, kind of starting off, uh, launching our uh, mission uh, here, uh, loving people into the acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ. And as Miles was saying, we're going to look at this kind of uh, in three different pieces. And this morning, I want to talk about the acceptance piece in this. And it's probably the, the part of this that we get asked the most questions about as we've kind of worked through this and stuff, and really good questions. And, and maybe the, the most mo common question is kind of this general, but really good question like, okay, what, what exactly do you mean by accepted in this? And the reason I think this is so important, such a good question, is because it ties into something uh, that Jesus modeled and something uh, that the New Testament teaches about acceptance that Jesus even taught. And, and it gets to more than just uh, our mission and our calling. There's something about this that is, like it's connected to the mission of Christ like going back some 2,000 years. And the reason I think that's so important is because we live in a world that needs this. Um, and, and to illustrate how this need uh, comes about, I, I wanna share a story with you that occurred uh, um, quite a few years ago. It's when my daughter, who's now like grown, was in middle school, I think it was the sixth grade, uh, she started playing uh, soccer for a little bit, had never played before, joined the school team, is playing. We had great fun. We'd go and, and uh, watch her games. And in one particular game, I remember uh, there was a parent, there was a dad uh, who kind of went past that line. You know, there's that line you can go past where you're no longer just like cheering on your kid, uh, you know, like, or even, you know, inspiring them forward to, you know, to do better, to try harder. He, it like, it crossed this line and became this thing that, um, that I still remember it. Um, there was one point uh, partway through the game uh, where his daughter, like she was driving the ball forward and she's trying to set up this pass. And right, and this is like sixth grade. This is not the World Cup, right? This is sixth grade soccer. And she's trying to set up this pass and isn't able to do it. And these two girls from the other team come up and they steal the ball. And he just like exploded in this moment. I remember him yelling at her like, don't you ever, ever let anyone take the ball away from you like that ever again. He was just like, and you're just like, whoa, like, like hold back. Like it just, but I think the thing that made it so difficult um, really was watching his daughter's reaction. Cause you could just tell like that, it just like sucked a little life out of her soul in that moment. And I, I remember being jarred by it a little bit and, and, and it went on through the game and maybe not to that intensity, but it, it was there. I, there was one moment where she was the one trying to steal the ball. And she was a great player. And she's trying to steal the ball. And, you know, the players come together and she ends up getting knocked to the ground and jumps up. And I remember the second she jumped up, the first thing she did was look over at her dad, who didn't say anything. But he had this look like, oh, like, there you go again. You, like, you, not good enough. And you could just, and just play after play you could see these moments happening. And, and by the end of the game, you just like, you, you didn't know whether to feel sorry or angry or both or whatever because you, you just saw what was happening. That it just was creating this kind of emptiness. This, this thing where the way I would describe it is, it's like she didn't feel like she had a place with her own dad in this. That's what was going on in this. P picture it this way. L let me explain the, the dynamic in this way. Imagine her, you know, 
coming to that game and she is like with her dad in that moment. In fact, like, like I saw him uh, like at moments like where he'd have his arm on her shoulder or something. Like that place, I'm, I'm with him. And then the game starts and she takes the field, right? And, and she would feel like he's with me, I'm with him. But then there's, you know, a moment where she falls down or something goes wrong and it's like, oh, like that wasn't good enough. And now like there's this distance there. And then another play and it's like, and it's like with each play, if there's like that small failure or that, she's just reading his reaction to this. And with each one, it's like there's maybe the question of like, am I wanted? And you know, in those moments where you experience something where because of what happens, you're left going, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm wanted. I, I, I don't know if this last moment left me in this way, it's like she just kept getting f- further and further away from feeling like she had this place with her own dad. And it just, it, like it hurts to watch that, to see someone experiencing that distance that gets created there. And I bring this up because, right, this doesn't just happen with soccer, right? Th- this is, in fact, it's really not about soccer at all, is it? It's a it's about relationship. But it's not just that, it's also with churches. It happens in ways where people will experience church in a similar way. They experience church in some way that is like, oh, and it's like there's that step that gets taken. And it's like, I'm a little bit further away. I'm, you know, do they really want me based on where my life is right now or what I'm struggling with or what I think. And when people begin to experience that with their church, the result is that is oftentimes how they will end up experiencing God in this. And just think about this, you know, parents, grandparents, like would you ever want your kid questioning if they have a place with God? Because like that's what happens in this so often. Or... Uh, your spouse, think about your spouse going through a difficult time of uh, struggles or doubts with God or, or something that challenges their faith in some way. And the mere fact that they're being challenged in some way in their faith or some struggle, you'd never want your, your spouse or someone you love to, to see them getting like pushed away from God, like, like God doesn't have a place for them. Like we, we hurt for them. Like, like, like what I experienced that day, you know, watching what was happening on the field in that moment in there and I just we live in a world where there are where there's this growing number of people who are experiencing church or God in this way and it's like they don't have a place in this and it's and it's the way and so often this happens because of the way they're experiencing uh, church or spiritual life And what I want you to get out of this morning, like the most important thing that I want you to take away from this morning is the mission of Christ is so different. This this thing where people are losing a place, like that is the opposite of the mission that Jesus has or what he wants. It's interesting, we're gonna look at uh, a letter written in the New Testament. Uh, It's uh, the letter to the Ephesians. Sometimes we call it the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. And we're gonna look at a passage in uh, chapter two. And if you wanna go there, you can. But let me just set the background to it because Paul, who writes this letter, he's speaking to this situation. He's actually speaking to people, in particular two groups. Um, that would feel this, like, do I have a place? And there would be one group, and he's going to refer to this group as those that are far. They're far they would feel far away from God. Um, these are the Gentiles. He even refers to them as this. And, the, and it's because the Gentiles, like, they didn't have Torah. They didn't have all these traditions. They didn't have all this stuff that would have, would have made them feel like in any way that they were close to God. They, they would have felt like this long, long distance from God uh, in this. And it's like, like, do we have a place with God? Right? But then he also talks about uh, those that are near. 
And there's this thing with people that are near, and this would have been the Jews or the Hebrews, and it's because they had the Old Testament. They had Torah. They had the, uh, the patriarchs uh, like Abraham and Joseph and Isaac and this rich heritage that would have had them like feeling, okay, we're closer to God. We're near to, to what all this means. But what he points out, which I think is, is so insightful, it's like even though they're near, there was always this conditional thing. There was this, this thing where even though they're near, it's like, I could lose my place. And so what he's trying to do here is he's trying to show these, these two different groups have the same struggle and it's Christ who, who offers them something beautiful because the ultimate consequence that what both of them are dealing with is one group feels like they have no place and the other group constantly worries that they'll lose the place that they have. And this is the struggle that they're having in this. So I want to read this passage uh, to you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And here, here's what he, he says. And he's going to go through several things. But, I, but listen to what he says here. Uh, starting in verse 14. He says, uh, speaking of Christ, For he himself is our peace. This is Jesus. Who has made the two, and he's pe- talking about these two different groups, um, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And those commandments and regulations, like those would be all those expectations, all those things that keep like pushing you away or put you in fear that you could lose your place. And then he goes on, look at the the second half of verse 15 and look at how he starts off. Um, His purpose, right? His purpose, like this is missional. Right? This is what he's on a mission to do. This is what his purpose to do. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Right? This is the work that Jesus did on the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace. Now, Watch how he brings these two groups up. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to you who were near, right? Do you see the beautiful thing that he's doing here? He's saying it doesn't matter if you feel like you've never had a place with God or if you have struggled in worry or fear or, sh- or just keep striving, but still know, what if I lose my place with God? Doesn't matter. What Jesus is saying is, I'll hold you close. I am, I'll become your peace on this issue. That little girl on the soccer field, what she did not have was peace. There was no peace that she had a place with every play, with every kick. If it didn't go the right way, it was like, oh my gosh, did I just get a little further away? Did I lose something? And it's like what Paul is saying is, he's like, okay, there's this thing that that some of you, you know, are far away. What do you have to do to get close? Be at peace, right? Jesus will hold you close. And those of you you that have lived under this thing of constantly trying to just hold on to that place, be at peace. Like, you don't have to live that way. You can have a place with God. He wants to hold you close. And what I love here is what Jesus is saying, like, literally here. Like, like what Paul is explaining is, Jesus' purpose is to provide a place for all of us. Look at what he says. Verse 18. In fact, let let me get a drink here. Verse 18, look at what he says here. He says, For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. That's acceptance. Acceptance is that starting place of you have access to me. Jesus' purpose is to provide a place for all of us. Near and far. And what I love, uh, I won't take the time to go through it here, but um, he goes on and he explains, and you know what the role of the church is? Is to take the purpose that Jesus was living out, and now we take on that purpose, and we live that out. We become an expression of Jesus in this world, helping to provide a place for those that would be near 
and those that would be far. Like this is just gorgeous what he walks out. How Jesus, like he is, like he's never, he is never standing on the sidelines barking at us in some way that diminishes our sense of whether or not we would have a place with him. That is not his purpose. His purpose is to create access to him. That's what he's getting at. So when you think about our mission, right? So when you, when you think about this mission, this idea, loving people into the acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ, when you think about that mission and the acceptance part of it, what we want you to think about in a practical way, the, just in a real practical way, this idea of acceptance is simply this. You have a place with us. That's how we live this out. To be a church that is just living this idea that, that wherever you're coming, near or far, you can have a place with us. Like we're just extending that thing that Jesus did in this. We're just living out what Paul says we're to live out uh, in this uh, moment with this because everyone has access to God. That's what Jesus uh, did in this. Um, so when you think about acceptance, it's you have a place with us. And you know where I'd want you to start with that? I'd want you to start with that with you like wherever you are, because there's always gonna be moments where we're gonna struggle at different moments in life and, and feel that distance maybe. But what I would want you to feel and experience within your church community is this message that you have a place with us. In fact, I want you to say that with me right now, okay? Say it now. You have a place with us. Yeah, so when you think about your own life, I want you to think that's the message I'm to hear. That's my community message helps me embrace that thing that Christ has for me. But I also want you to think about this. When you think about, like, maybe you have a friend. Maybe there's someone you care about or love. And, you know, like, they've got all these reasons why they would be distant from church. And as you think about it, like, I would want you to think about what you, what you have to offer them as a part of this church is the this, is this same thing, this idea of acceptance that says you have a place with us. In fact, say it with me again. You have a place with us. That's right. Uh, when you think about when you're here on a Sunday, right? Maybe you're here on a Sunday and all of a sudden you run into someone else and you realize it's their first Sunday or their second Sunday or you, you can tell they're a little tenuous. Like sometimes people will show up and you can tell like they've been to, uh, like, in fact, last service had someone who showed up and they were just like, um... Online, it didn't feel this big. And I'm a little like, and you can just tell they wanted to just back off. But like, there were like people that just in, not like in an overpowering way and smothering them, but just like made them feel welcome in that moment. And you know what? We all have that opportunity. We all get to make this place a place that has this beautiful message, this beautiful vibe that is simply, and say it with me again, ready? You have a place with us. Yeah. Wherever, wherever we are, maybe it's in your volunteer uh, area, whether you're working with kids or maybe you're working in the welcome ministry or a technical area or something uh, with our youth or adults, you get to carry out this beautiful, uh, beautiful idea of what our mission is a part of. Say it with me one more time, ready? And it is, you have a place with us. Because every time Jesus encountered people, that maybe thought that they were far. People worried if they could lose their place. You know what they experienced in Jesus? That they had a place with him. I love that about Jesus. And this is what we see so clearly in his life and in his mission. Let me give you one example uh, about this. There's a moment where Jesus is traveling and he goes into this ancient city of Jericho and there's just crowds of people and they're following him. They're all excited about him. And the story tells us he runs into this one individual and uh, his name is Zacchaeus. Maybe some of you have heard, uh, you know, the story about Zacchaeus who climbs the, the tree. Well, what we also know is that he was the chief tax collector. And without going into a lot of things here, what you need to know is... Uh, uh, Luke, who writes about this, and we're going to look at this story for just uh, a moment here. He's telling us that, that Zacchaeus, like he's probably hated by his people in his uh, broader community because he would have been Jewish, now siding with the Romans to gouge and cheat and manipulate uh, money um, and everything he could, he could get out of his own people in collaboration with the Romans. 
would have lied, steal, like they, they were seen as the lowest in here. But something happens and Zacchaeus, for whatever reason, is curious about spiritual things, curious about this man, Jesus, and no doubt would have walked away from his faith a long time ago, but something has compelled him to come back and think about this. And so the text says that as these crowds are like surrounding Jesus or whatever, Zacchaeus runs on ahead and climbs this tree because he's just curious. He wants to see like, like what's going on with it? What's different about this Jesus character? And then in the story, uh, Jesus, like he understands what's going on and he starts to make his way where Zacchaeus is. And we pick up the story here. Um, and if you want, you can follow along in Luke chapter uh, 19, uh, verse five, it says this. Um, it says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, right? And Zacchaeus is up in this tree. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must, and here's the amazing part. I must stay at your house today, right? And now we think of that and we're just like, wow, kind of imposing on Jesus, right? We're just like, I'm gonna invite myself over to your house. And in our culture, that would be kind of a weird thing, right? And just, I'm, you know, someone you barely even know and just say, I'm gonna come over and stay at your house. Man, uh, you know, I'd like some dinner. And if you've got a guest best bedroom and like, I'll stay there or whatever. Um, but understand, very different in the first century. Uh, this is a hospitality culture where when a rabbi would say this, th this was very honoring for a rabbi to say, I wanna share a meal at your house. I wanna stay at your house. A, a declaration is being made here. When Jesus says this right in the context of this story, what Jesus is saying is, you have a place with me, Zacchaeus. I see you. And I'm gonna, I wanna be with you. You have a place with me, right? And this like would have stunned people, like out of all the people, like there'd be so many people that would be more deserving of Jesus staying with them, of, of the time to share a meal with Jesus, maybe stay over and have the disciples and get to be a part of some conversations. And you know, like, it's just like this guy, this, like this, like he's the, He's the chief tax collector. This guy, has, he has cheated his own family. He's cheated all of us. He is like manipulated. He's lied. He's just like, why would you give this guy the time of day? And yet you are bestowing like this honor with him. Like this, like people would have struggled uh, with this. Um, you know, uh, we think about this uh, today and, and, and we get that feeling. Like there's always moments where just like, like, that person seems like they're far from God. That person, that person has a place with God. You know, there's this thing, this, this truth that comes out, uh, out of this story. And the first one is this, people have always struggled with acceptance, right? Like when Jesus says these words, I'm gonna stay at your house. How do you think the people reacted? You think they were like, wow, that's really special. He's reached out and I bet Zacchaeus was thinking he'd, no rabbi would want to spend time. This is wonderful. Let's celebrate. No, that's not what happened. In fact, look at verse seven. Look at verse seven. Here, here's what happens. Verse seven. All the people saw this and began to mutter. Don't you? I love that word. The muttering. Um, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Like why that person? Why make this statement to this person? And it gets to this struggle that we all have because I think there's this worry. And, and I just, I, I wanna point this out because there's something we really, I want us to glean from Christ in this. There's this worry that we have that when we communicate acceptance, like, am I saying that I am approving of the way they treat people? Am I saying that I'm approving of every behavior or everything that they would do in their lives. Like, is this like, is this just like giving permission for unbridled pleasure seeking, seeking, seeking and sin? And like, like, is this, and we worry about this. They worried about this. People have always worried about it. You know what's interesting? Jesus didn't seem to worry about it. Like, he, he doesn't bring it up. He just, like, no conditions. He just sees Zacchaeus hiding up in that tree and he knows his heart. And it's like, 
I want to make sure that that guy who probably either feels far away or feels like he's lost his place. You know, you think about that continuum from like, I'm right here and I have a place with God to someone way, way, way out on that continuum. I bet Jesus looks at it and goes, he's way out there. I'm gonna make a point of making sure he knows that he has a place with me. Now, Jesus displays two things here that I think help us with this because we're all gonna struggle at moments on this that, that to make, to, to say, to be the church that says, whoever you are, if you come to this place, curious, seeking, struggling, we want to do our best to say, you have a place with us. Like, we're good. there could be moments where we're going to struggle with that. And that's okay. Like, we're, we're, that means we're normal. That's what that means. There's two things that Jesus displays here that I want you to see that maybe will help us in our mission to live out the mission that Jesus modeled for us. And the first one is, is this. There's a difference between acceptance and approval. Like, the, like, there's what we don't have here. There's not a moment where Jesus is approving of those things that Zacchaeus did. Like, J- Jesus doesn't sit down at dinner with Zacchaeus and say, hey, yeah, it's great to have dinner with you. And, you know, all that lying and stealing and cheating and gouging people you did. Yeah, yeah, I'm, when I, after dinner, I, you know, go back out and get some more, cheat some more. He's not doing, right? That's, that's not what he's saying. There's not a moment where Jesus is saying, I'm approving of this, right? But Jesus is able to separate the difference between approving of being approving of those things and saying, you, but you still have a place with me. I'm, there you will, I, I want you to have access to me in this. That's the difference. Jesus always had a place for them. And friends, we can do the same thing. We can. Second thing that Jesus displays uh, in this that helps even further, I I think, for us, is this. Acceptance is transformative. There is something so powerful about uh, acceptance in transforming the human heart in ways that few things can. You know, you think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus grew up in a tradition. Remember when uh, Paul talks about all the commands and all of the, uh, the rituals and the regulations? Zacchaeus grew up with that. He knew that. He had all of those things in place. He grew up learning Torah. He would have grown up hearing the teachings of the rabbi. He would have had a family that would have said, right, here are the regulations. Here are the rules. You need to be following all of these things. He grew up doing that. And I can imagine that as he starts stepping into this world, like with the Romans, where, you know, a little bit of cheating here, a few lies here, you know, gouge a few people there. Like, as he's stepping into that, You've got to know that he's got people speaking into his life as he's slipping into that that are saying, Zacchaeus, that, you know, you can't do that. That's wrong, right? I bet his own family was saying, you know, this, don't do this, right? There's a rule over here about not behaving this way. I bet his own rabbi spoke to him about this stuff. But how did all of that turn out? He ended up the chief tax collector. Here's my point. That system of rules and regulations, man, there's something that's so tempting that feels just like if I could just get that, that's powerful. That'll change a life. But it's really quite weak, isn't it? But there's something about acceptance that is really very transformational, that is more powerful than the old covenant, the old way. In fact, uh, I want you to look back at the story. Look at um, verse 8, Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Um, and we get the idea of the context that they're probably already at Zacchaeus' uh, house here, uh, maybe having a meal. Um, verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount wow, I just like, what's he doing? Like, it's just like, it's, and notice, 
It's not like Jesus says, well, you know, if, if you want me to accept you, if you want to be close to God, like you need, I need some real proof that you're serious about this. You go, you start giving away your stuff to the poor, right, instead of cheating people, and then I'll know, and then let's talk. No, it starts with acceptance. And there's something so powerful about that that it begins to, the process of transforming Zacchaeus to the man that has spent how many years cheating people, not caring, is all of a sudden, his heart is changing. Acceptance has a way of changing the heart. And sometimes we worry about acceptance. Like, are we turning people loose? And what I want to say is, you know, Jesus gives us a different lens to look at it. Acceptance is that first step to a transformed life. It is something really powerful that opens people up to being changed in deep and profound ways. We worry that acceptance opens somebody up to a worse life, that like we're giving them permission to do something that's going to make their life worse. Honestly, very rarely have I ever seen anyone experience genuine acceptance that didn't help their life in some kind of beautiful way. We, it's, it's a human need. And, and it's where Jesus starts in all of this. It's the first step in growth in all of this. And it is a part of his mission. I love how he ends this story. He ends this story, uh, just uh, look at verse 10. Because there would have been people that would have, right, they would have struggled, just like we would struggle with it. But, uh, and this is Jesus' words, verse 10, Jesus' words. For the Son of Man, speaking of himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's his mission. And it starts with, helping people that are near and helping people that are far have access to him, that they experience acceptance because then they know I will hold you close in all of this. And friends, I say all of this because our world, and I said this earlier, but I I wanna walk this just for a second. Our world needs this. You realize statistically in the U.S. right now, Church attendance is in a kind of decline like it is never seen in the history of our country. And in particular, not just in the decline of people attending churches, it is the decline of people even uh, saying that they're affiliated with churches. It's not just people saying, you know, I'm just, I'm not, you know, I, I... I'm just not gonna go as often or something. It is people saying, I am stepping away from that. I don't, I don't even wanna claim that anymore. And you know what, and when you look at the research, you know what group is in the steepest decline, the fastest loss? Evangelicals. Those that would say we're followers of Jesus Christ, that like, and it's like, what's going on with that? Why? And I think part of it is because people aren't experiencing this really basic fundamental thing that, that Jesus was so good at, that he modeled constantly, right? It's no wonder we would see a decline in our country if what people most often experience or think of is that churches are, they're, they're like somebody off on the sidelines barking orders at them about all the things wrong with them, barking at them all the things that need to be done better, their disappointment with them. All, if, if that's what they experience, right? If they experience do better, right? If they experience this thing of like, I don't know if I'm wanted, right? I, I sure don't feel like I have a place in that. Then, then no wonder what we're seeing happen is going to happen in this, right? There are so many, and yet the opportunity is there. There are so many people in, in our community, in our country, and they come at this and they're curious about spiritual things. They may be a skeptic. They may have doubts, but there are plenty of people that are searching and looking, but you know where they're gonna turn and search or look? Where they feel like 
there's a place for someone who's a searcher, or there's a place for someone who doesn't necessarily buy everything right now. You know, one of the things I love about this place is we, this value of saying, you don't have to, to believe to belong. Like, like you, you can come and be a part of this and you don't have to be convinced if you're looking and you're searching, if you're willing to walk through the door of this place and hang out with us, that's enough. You're welcome. Search away, right? Yeah. And so if that's you right now, just notice that spontaneously what happened in this room and the kind of people you're with. You have a place here. And that wasn't planned. If you're brand new here, that wasn't a plan. There wasn't a secret signal that said clap on this one, to, right? right? Yeah. That was hearts that did that. You know, I think, um, I think about the world and the people that we have that have stepped away from the evangelical world because they would look at something in their life and they would just say, I don't meet the standard or I've tried or I'm just worn out from trying to hold my place on that continuum and always worried about losing it, right? I think about um, some very specific examples. I think about a mom that I met a few years ago who uh, grew up going to a church, and, but it was this rough experience for her because uh, early on she got this message, it li literally said to her as a young girl, uh, kids are to be seen and not heard. And she got that message going all the way through youth and just, it was just like this, like she like, was never, right, right, never really wanted, right? Needed to be there, but not really wanted. Just, you be silent and just, and there were some other wounds that occurred and all of that. And as soon as she was old enough, as she became like an older teenager and could drive herself, she stopped going to church and was just like, I'm never going to church again. Like that, that hurt. And then she becomes a mom and she has two little kids. And there's this thing that starts to stir in her where she's just like, you know, I, I want them I want him to be able to explore God. And she thinks back on her child and she's like, you know, there were some good things about my church experience. There were some things about God that I just, I just, I want my kids to have that. She ends up going back uh, to a church that was similar to the church of her youth, same, a similar denomination, goes back. And after, I think it was just two or three weeks and uh, uh, it was before church started and they were in the main service and her kids were like kidding around or, or, or doing something. And someone, and this person had no idea, I, I'm sure they didn't mean it in a malicious way, but they turned to one of her kids that was being like a little noisy before the church service started and literally said the words, you know, kids should be seen and not heard. And she said it was like a bolt of lightning from her past just stabbed her in the heart. She goes, I didn't know what else to do. And literally in that moment, right before church started, she gathered up her kids got in the car and she says, I'm walking my two little ones out to the car to put them in their car seats. She just said, I started bawling uncontrollably. And they're like, mommy, what's wrong? Like, then they, she had no way to explain it. She puts them in the car seat and just, it's just like, she's so torn. Starts driving back, literally driving down La Choya. Tears bawling and over this conflict of, I want my kids to have something that connects them to God, but I'm afraid that I'll connect them to God through a church in some way that will wound them in a way that I was wounded. And then, and just like, can you imagine the, the torment? Drives past our parking lot, sees our sign, and is torn over this whole thing. Gets to the intersection of um, Lambert and Lachoya, goes through the intersection pulls off to the side of the road, does a U-turn and comes back bawling in tears as she comes on the campus in total desperation. And I ask the question, what would we want that mom to experience? We would want her and her kids to walk on this campus and feel to the core of their being, I have a place here. They, they want me, I'm wanted here, I have a place here. And I am so grateful for every volunteer, for every person who worked with her kids, for every person, every one of you that sat next to her. That was like the experience she had and it just pulled her back into this beautiful, beautiful hope. I think about a guy that I uh, know that literally 
uh, just went through this crossroads in his own faith and as he's struggling with this thing, like his friends didn't know what to do with his personal struggles over faith or whatever. And he's just felt like I was abandoned by them and he didn't want to have anything more to do with church and his church went through some weird things. And he's just like, no more church. But he was like down to like one friend, he said at this, at this moment. And he said, this church, or this friend was going to this church and he kept inviting me and I didn't want to go. But like... I don't want to lose this friend. <laughs> and he says this like tongue in cheek. And he says, so literally I started coming to church and I would sit in the back row of the church and I was grumpy and I had a bad attitude and I didn't want to listen to anything, right? And he was sitting right back over there Sunday after Sunday. And he said, at one point it started to get through to me. And he said, the thing was, I could come in grumpy, I could come in struggling, but I had a place. And it's like God finally broke through my heart in this place. And it's changed everything in his life. He's like, and to hear his story now, like you'd never know the struggles and the doubts that he went through. But he just needed a place that said, it's okay to doubt, it's okay to struggle. You can sit in the back row. <laughs> That's okay. See, I think about another story of, um, of, a, of a woman. This, this story, very, very recent. This uh, story, one of our close friends, um, Nicole, who uh, Angie and I have been friends with uh, before we were married, before any of us had kids or anything, and she uh, has a, a friend in her life that two or three years ago deeply wounded by some things that occurred in church and her struggle and just thought there will, I'll never make it back to church. And had, hadn't been to church in like over two years. And our friend Nicole just said, you know, I, I think you'd, you'd experience something different if you went to my church. And invited her and invited her. And then she showed up. And I, and Nicole forwarded me this text message. Let me find it. Um, late yesterday and said I could, I could read this. And this is a text message from this uh, woman who came and tried us out here not too long ago. And she writes this. She says, here goes. Um, I had not been in church for over two years, partly because of COVID, but mainly because church had become a place of judgment and condemnation. I felt further from God every time I entered the doors. I went through a divorce and my world became very small. Some Christian friends disappeared from my life. I didn't like the God I saw in church anymore. Legalism and judgment destroyed my marriage and it destroyed my church experience. A friend, and this is Nicole, a friend encouraged me to come to CASAS and only, in all caps, and only because I trusted her was I willing to try it. I left my first service there and cried. It was the first time I felt safe in church in a very long time. Maybe it was just a fluke. Excuse me. Maybe it was just a fluke, I thought. Uh, but the next week, I felt the same. And the next, and the next. I had to leave church. This is so insightful. I had to leave church a few years ago to find my way back to God. And now I can worship and experience God within church again. And honestly, I didn't know if, I would ever, if that would ever happen. I am so grateful for the love and grace-filled hearts of the people at Casas who make church a safe place again. And he has a little smiley face at the very bottom of it. Isn't that gorgeous? See? That was the mission of Jesus. I'll hold you close. It's, it doesn't start with what you have to do so that you can have a place with me. I have a place for you. Come and try it. And that becomes our mission. So friends, when we think about acceptance in our mission, it's really easy. It's just saying we're going to be the kind of church that's going to make a place for all of us. And that's a church that we can love and be a part of. And I could not be more grateful to get to do that 
with a better group of people. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Why don't we stand? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this in prayer here. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me pray. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this, uh, this body of believers and this group of people. And I know there are people here that maybe don't believe in you yet, but that are a part of this, and we're glad that they're here. And we pray that you just keep working in their hearts and their souls and their minds and in all of us. And we trust you. We trust you on this journey, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Have a great Sunday. See you next week.
the day.